All right, let me open our time with a word of prayer. God, you are a good and holy and righteous God. And in your graciousness, you've been pleased to declare men and women and children righteous so that they share in, uh, in your own life, in, in eternal life. God, I pray for our time this morning that as we look at the words that you so marvelously communicated to us, that it would move us to be better lovers of you, more faithful, more obedient, more eager to believe you, that we would even see the wisdom of adhering to your words with a, a trusting heart. God, compel us this morning from your word. You've uh, communicated in such a way that ought to move our hearts to, to gravitate toward you. And only your spirit can, can produce that effect in hearts like ours that naturally incline themselves to uh, evil and waywardness, God, I pray that you would fill our hearts with high thoughts of you so that you would be more honored in our lives, in our homes, in our church, in our neighborhoods, and everywhere you place us. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. In his book, Holiness, J.C. Ryle had this to say about the importance of the doctrine of sanctification. Sanctification in its place and proportion is quite as important as justification. Satan knows well the power of true holiness and the immense injury, which increased attention to it will do to his kingdom. It is his interest, therefore, to promote strife and controversy about this part of God's truth. Just as in time past, he has succeeded in mystifying and confusing men's minds about justification. So he is laboring in the present day to make men darken counsel by words without knowledge about sanctification. He wrote that in 1877, and it might have well might as well have been pinned yesterday. Listen at what else Ryle says about the relationship between faith and holiness. That faith in Christ is the root of all holiness. That the first step towards a holy life is to believe in Christ. That until we believe we have not a jot of holiness that union with Christ by faith is the secret of both beginning to be holy and continuing holy, that the life that we live in the flesh, we must live by the faith of the Son of God, that faith purifies the heart, that faith in, is the victory which overcomes the world, that by faith the elders obtained a good report, all these are truths with which no well-instructed Christian will ever think of denying. In describing the importance of this doctrine of sanctification and the relationship of faith to it, Ryle is treading very old paths. What Ryle is communicating about the importance of sanctification and the role that faith plays in sanctification, he is merely walking in the footsteps of Old Testament prophets and New Testament apostles. And so this morning, I want us to look at really one statement by both the Old Testament prophets and the New Testament apostles, or one New Testament apostle, that really highlights this singular point that faith must be the all-consuming priority of the believer's life. Faith must be the all-consuming priority 
of the believer's life. And to see that, open your Bibles to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 specifically will be in verse 17. In this familiar passage, we get the doctrine of the New and Old Testament. It's the same. Faith must be the all-consuming priority of the believer's life. Read along. Follow along as I read Romans chapter 1. I'll start in verse 16. Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. This singular point that faith must be the all-consuming priority of the believer's life is what Paul is emphasizing. It's what he's capturing in that phrase in verse 17, from faith to faith, from faith to faith. This construction, the from something to something, Oftentimes when it's found in your your New Testament, that construction is communicating progress, some sort of progress, sort of an incremental uh, movement from one thing to another. Can you think of another place where you've seen that same construction uh, where you can think of a similar phrase from to we've looked at it numerous times in this series on sanctification, go to second Corinthians three, just hold your place in Romans. And that same construction appears in chapter three, verse 18 of second Corinthians here, not talking about faith degrees of it, but glory But we all, Paul says here, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the spirit. And so this really does communicate progress here. He's talking about sanctification happening Uh, an improvement in one sanctification going from one degree of glory to a, an increasing degree of glory. That's what's happening in the life of the believer as the Holy spirit transformed us more into the image of Christ here in Romans one, the from faith to faith is denoting the progress that the believer makes as he increases in his faith from the beginning of his Christian life on step by step all the way through to the end of that Christian life. He is going from faith to faith. Just by way of example, Romans four, Paul describes this happening in one man's life. Abraham Romans four twenty. Or you can back up to 19. He says, Abraham did this without becoming weak in faith. He contemplated his own body now as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but instead what? grew strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully assured that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. So these promises that came to Abraham so late in life, 
and from a human perspective were impossible to accomplish, Abraham still, by clinging to the promises of God, grew strong in faith. This is the very thing that Paul's describing when he talks about in chapter 1, verse 17, the righteousness of God being revealed from faith to faith. This is progress in faith. As uh, one preacher, Jonathan Moorhead, uh, interprets this verse, what he calls this phrase, he says, Paul's intent is to express that we are saved from faith in justification to faith in persevering sanctification, from saving faith experienced in the moment of salvation to the enduring faith lived in the course of life. That's what's happening in every single Christian's life. And if you have believed Jesus, if you have claimed him as Lord and willfully submitted your life to his good, light, not burdensome yoke, then that should be a great encouragement to you this morning. Regardless of how you feel, Christian, regardless of the hindrances, hindrance, hindrances, numerous hindrances that you see in your life as a Christian, that you may feel acutely this morning, ways that you are weak, perhaps in your walk, what God says that he is doing once he justifies the believer is moving them in increments in their faith. And so really what this communicates, if the believer at the point of justifying faith and conversion is progressing toward an unending, enduring and persevering sanctification as faith in sanctification, then what this should encourage us toward is to intentionally make faith the all consuming priority of our Christian life to intentionally pursue belief in God from this passage, Romans 1 17 faith must be the all consuming priority of the believer's life really for three reasons indicated in this text. And that's what we'll walk through this morning. These three reasons why faith must be the all consuming priority of our lives. And number one, because God must be glorified because God must be glorified. God does not have a superior agenda than making his glory known. That is God's own purpose. Before he had created anything on day one of creation, this is why God existed to just be his glorious self. And so now that he has chosen to create and in time, save men and women and children from the consequences of their sin, from their own enslavement to sin, the agenda has not changed. God still exists and everything else that he has created exists for this preeminent purpose to reveal who God is. That is what it means for God to be glorified. And since God has set his sights pri primarily on this, his own glorification, then you, Christian, must make faith the all-consuming priority of your life because faith is what most glorifies God. And that's what this text communicates. Look at verse 17 again. In the gospel, that message, that good message, that good word to be believed by believers the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, but the righteous shall live by faith. By putting faith, your faith in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed in that. That is God's righteousness inherent in his own character, which is the same righteousness that he imputes to the believers account upon the moment that they exercise faith in Jesus. 
that righteousness is gloriously displayed in faith. His righteousness is being revealed. Not only his righteousness, but if you just back up to verse 16, his power is being exercised when the believer puts faith in the gospel. Verse 16, this is why Paul is not ashamed of that good word. Because that good word, the gospel, is the power of God for salvation to save who? Everyone, anyone, specifically anyone who does what? Believes. Anyone who exercises faith in the gospel, that demonstrates the power of God to radically save them. So the power of God is being exercised in someone placing their faith in the gospel. His righteousness is being revealed when someone exercises faith in the gospel. And not only that, but Paul is already by this point in the letter mentioned some other things about God that are revealed by virtue of faith being exercised by people in this singular message of salvation. Just go back to the beginning of the letter. Paul, a bondservant of Christ, Jesus called as an apostle set apart for the gospel of God, which he, God promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy scriptures before faith was exercised by people in the gospel before anyone ever entrusted the, their own souls, their eternal destiny to God by believing the gospel, God had already promised these things beforehand through the prophets. So God's own faithfulness is on the line when he has determined through the gospel to save sinners. If God has made a promise to send his son to die for the sins of all those who believe, and no one comes to saving faith, then God's own reputation in his faithfulness is on the line. It's nullified. Hey, that promise you made to save people, that didn't happen. And if anyone whom God promised to save is not saved, then God's faithfulness collapses. God is demonstrating, he's proving his faithfulness when he saves men and women through the gospel, because he promised this very thing beforehand. This was through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Notice that adjective attached to the Scriptures. What kind of writing, what kind of Scriptures are these? These are Holy Scriptures. This is a, a writing like no other. The word that God spoke that was penned by the prophets in the Old Testament all of those promises that he made through those men that they wrote down, this was a word like no other. It was holy. So his word being set apart from any other word, being a holy word, that was on display when these prophets communicated the gospel. When you get up in the morning and you derive encouragement from God's promises, even in the Old Testament, to save people this specific way, by grace, through faith. He produces a transformed life in those people whom he transforms, whom he saves by grace through faith. You can derive encouragement from those words, even though they're ancient, because they're not like any other words. They still bear a tremendous impact on you, even though they're that old. No other words are like those. These are holy scriptures. Also, God must be glorified in his son being manifested. Just look at verse three. He promised this gospel through his prophets in the holy scriptures concerning his son who was born of a descendant of David, according to the flesh. He was declared the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus, our Christ, our Lord. 
in Jesus being gloriously manifested in time, this message about God's son, specifically the one who was born of this bloodline, the descendant of David, according to the flesh, he was truly man as surely as he was truly God. And he was declared with power to be the son of God by the resurrection from the dead. All of those truths revealed about Christ that puts God's glory on display in his son. And then other attributes of God, his grace being given, his peace being experienced, his wrath being absorbed. Paul just circles the wagon on these attributes all throughout the book of Romans. You can just trace these out, the glorification of Christ, the righteousness of God, the power of God, the holiness of God, specifically in what he has spoken, uh, his grace being extended to sinners, powerfully and effectively so, sinners having peace in being reconciled with God, his wrath being put on display. All of these things are, are happening specifically through the avenue of faith in the gospel. And so because God must be glorified, because faith is the chosen vehicle, faith in the gospel being the chosen vehicle by which God intends to shine a bright light on all of his attributes, then you Christian must make faith the all consuming priority of your life. Do you want to see God glorified in your life? Do you want God to be glorified in the privacy of your own heart? Do you want to see God glorified in your home, in this church, in the various ministries within this church in which you serve? Then you must fixate on faith. Go after all of those things. Go after holiness of life, faithfulness in all of those avenues. Believing God, believing specific truths that God has communicated in his word. Faith must also be the all consuming priority in the believer's life. Number two, because the gospel precludes boasting. The gospel precludes boasting. It makes it impossible. The gospel makes boasting absolutely impossible. It's also here in this text. Faith makes boasting impossible. This is why scripture repeatedly contrasts dependent God produced faith with independent self-righteous works of men. Just notice in verse 17, back in Romans one, what's revealed from faith to faith. It is not the glory of man. It is not the righteousness of man. No. Verse 17 says in this gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Faith highlights something amazing about God, not man. Faith humbles man, puts him in the dust where we belong and exalts God high, his work, his righteousness, his goodness, his grace, his justice. Here's a few ways that faith precludes boasting by condemning mankind. Faith, when you exercise faith in the gospel, then you cast your vote with God. You amen God that you are condemned as a guilty sinner before him. No one has ever believed the gospel without agreeing with that statement. I am a guilty sinner worthy of God's condemnation. He is just to condemn me. And let me show you a few places where we see this in as Paul expands on this idea, verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men 
who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For ever since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they, those men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four footed animals and crawling creatures. It's a description of the length to which truth suppressors eventually go becoming worshipers of creation because they exchange God's glory for lesser created things. They are foolish, even though they claim to be wise. You don't need to look very far to watch how pervasive that is in our culture, right? The wise men of our day, Supreme Court justices who can't tell you what a woman is, professing to be wise, that is a fool. This is because man is suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. And every act, whether consistently and characteristically true of someone, or in a moment when we exchange the glory of God for lesser things, then we are making this exchange. We are suppressing some truth. We are not believing God. We are instead believing a lie. So when faith is exercised in the gospel, then this precludes our boasting in self because we agree with God that we fit the description. We are truth suppressors who have dishonored God. We have not thanked him as we ought. And so we are guilty. Faith does that. We also agree with God that we are worthy of this wrath mentioned in verse 18. Even look at the, the way this passage ends, this long description in verse 32, as God gives over, gives over, gives over man to further degrees of sin. Verse 32 says, although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things as the sins he just mentioned, those people are worthy of death. Even though we know this, that is, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice such things. Everyone who believes the gospel believes this. We agree with God's terms. We are guilty sinners before him. We deserve his wrath. The gospel also makes it boasting impossible by revealing God again, just We've already mentioned this, but it is verses 16 and 17 that say his power is revealed. His righteousness is revealed. Faith in the gospel does not reveal the power of man. Faith in the gospel does not reveal the righteousness of man so that when someone puts faith in the gospel, when they finally believe Jesus and see God's glory, they look at themselves and go, wow, how strong am I? Wow, how just am I? So that they become impressed with self. That does not happen when someone believes the gospel. When someone believes the gospel also, they don't boast in their ability to save self, but Christ is exalted. Christ is exalted. The the gospel precludes boasting by exalting 
the son of God. The gospel is about him, not about the sinner. We can often get this confused really easily because it's true that God's love is displayed for us in the gospel. John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have eternal life. God did that displaying his love, right? God demonstrated his love to us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. And God did not love you for the sake of you. God loved you for the sake of himself. If loving sinners would cost God any amount of glory, then he would not love sinners. God loves sinners because it glorifies him to do so. His, the glory of his love is displayed in his love for sinners. And so by exalting Christ, making him the one that saves sinners, the only hope for mankind, by extending love through that avenue of a sinless substitute in his son, enduring his wrath and raising again, that glorifies God. That does not glorify man. That does not exalt man. It exalts Christ. Also by saving believers, clearly faith does this. The gospel precludes boasting by only saving those who believe the message an impossible feat to believe something so absurd as the message of the gospel. This is foolishness to those who are perishing. Paul says in Romans or uh, first Corinthians one, when you believe this message, Christian, you are believing something absurd to your natural reasoning. This is why your friends who insist on being reasoned into belief still don't believe it can't happen. It's impossible. The terms on which someone is saved is by faith alone. It's impossible with man. So by making those the boundaries of salvation, faith, no one gets in apart from a supernatural work of God. By only saving, according to verse 16, those who believe Jews first and Greeks, and Gentiles, God has ensured that no one has grounds for boasting. Just look at chapter four. Verse one, what shall we say then that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh has found for if Abraham was justified by works, not faith, he has something to boast about but not before God for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. It does not say he obeyed God. It does not say he submitted himself to God's law. It says he believed God and God credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one verse four who works, his wage is not credited as a favor. That's a description of grace. It's not a favor. It's not grace, but as what is due, it's what he's owed. In contrast, verse five to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is a man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. So these are in stark contrast. You work and earn your salvation. Then you have grounds for boasting. This is not the way it is with God. This is why he is only determined to save men only by faith alone so that no one gets grounds for boasting. Abraham being a premier example of that principle. The gospel precludes boasting also by prioritize by prioritizing Jews and including Greeks to the Jew first and to the Greek. 
even now, that's the, the pattern. The offer, the grace is first extended to the Jews, and yes, also to the Greeks. And this makes both groups, Jews and Greeks, unable to boast. This is for a few reasons. Just flip all the way back to Genesis 12. When God decided to make these initial promises to one man who was an idolater from descendants at Babel, on what basis did he select this one man, Abram, Abraham? Genesis 12, one tells us or shows us now Yahweh said to Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land, which I will show you and I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great. And so you will be a blessing and I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So Abraham, Abram went forth as Yahweh had spoken to him. Abraham's pretty passive. There's nothing said about Abraham's desirability, lovability, uniqueness. He's just a guy. Just a guy. And God, chapter 12, verse 1 says, speaks to him a word of blessing, a good word that has nothing to do with Abraham. He, he offered God nothing and gave God no motivation to select him. All of his descendants subsequent to him who get priority in the promises that has nothing to do with them. Just like it had nothing to do with Abraham. So Jews have no cause for boasting. This is stated differently. Just flip over to Deuteronomy chapter seven. God tells Israel, reminds Israel as they're about to be sent into the promised land. And there is warning after gracious warning given to them. God reminds them in the midst of these words why he doesn't love them. He's remind, they're reminded, even though God loves them, what the reason is not. Deuteronomy 7.7, 7, Yahweh did not, God says, set his love on you nor choose you because you were in more in number than any of the peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But because Yahweh loved you and kept the oath which he swore to your forefathers, Yahweh brought you out by a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. God didn't set his love on Israel, nor did he choose them because they were some sort of great nation. They were 70 people, ragtag bunch, one family, barely surviving in the midst of a famine coming into Egypt. And God was already planning for this when they had no idea what was happening. God chose them, even though they were not notable people. God verse eight says, love them and kept the oath, which he swore. So he just decided to love them. And he kept his faithful word, upheld his own faithfulness. That's why they came out of Egypt because of God's own sovereign love and commitment to his own name, his own reputation. Israel brought nothing to the table. And so when they're prioritized among all the nations, that has nothing to do with them. So this gospel that includes the Gentiles and even prioritizes prioritizes them precludes boasting, but it also includes Gentiles. And that also precludes boasting. Just flip over to Romans 11. Romans 11. 
Paul is hitting a crescendo in this argument about Jews being prioritized and also Greeks being included. And at this point, he's about to just burst forth in song because he is so in awe, even as the truth of God about this gospel comes through him. But he says this first, as he talks about the Jews not receiving the promises being cut off for a time and the Gentiles being grafted into those promises given to the forefathers. Verse 28 of Romans 11, from the standpoint of the gospel, they Jews are enemies for your sake. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you Gentiles once were disobedient to God, but now have been shown mercy because of their, the Jews, disobedience. So these also now have been disobedient that because of the mercy shown to you, they also may now be shown mercy. For God has shut up all that is Jew and Gentile in disobedience so that he may show mercy to all. Gentiles don't have any cause for boasting. The promises didn't come to them. They were outsiders. We Gentiles were outsiders. We did not have access nor rights to the promises. Those were promised to the Jews, the descendants of Abraham. And yet by faith, God has seen it fit to include Gentiles into those promises grafted us in, we have no cause for boasting. No more than the Jews who weren't selected for any reason of their own and who currently are cut off so that when God finally does redeem Israel, then all of us together, Jews and Gentiles who inherit the promises by faith, will look at each other and say, what are we doing here? Can you believe this? What mercy, what mercy by faith, no works of our own, no merits that we've earned. God has designed it this way. So no one will boast. This only comes by the gospel as it is received by faith. This is from faith and then to faith. And then finally, The gospel precludes boasting by affirming the Old Testament. And this will take us to our third point. Why faith must be the all consuming priority of the believer's life. It's because true life requires faith. True life in the way that this New Testament apostle and the Old Testament prophet Habakkuk mean it. This life requires faith. And to see that, I want to just direct your attention one more time to Romans 117 before we go back to Habakkuk 2.4, where it's quoted. The point that the Apostle Paul is making, that God's righteousness is revealed from faith to faith, is supported, you'll notice in verse 17, by Habakkuk's former statement, the righteous shall live by faith. Paul Paul is proving his point by quoting Habakkuk for in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith. That's at justification to faith and persevering sanctification as it is written, or even just as it is written, but the righteous shall live by faith. That's proving Paul's point. That this good word that God justifies sinners apart from their merit on the basis of faith alone, he saves them, declares them righteous, and transforms them to live a life by faith of faithfulness to God. That message is not new. That message is even communicated by the Old Testament prophets. 
by one particular Old Testament prophet in Habakkuk. Therefore, even as, just as it is written, I mean, you remember, Romans, this from the Holy Scriptures. Don't the righteous live by faith? Go back to Habakkuk chapter 2. And we'll see how this Old Testament prophet's words support the point being made here. Saving faith and justification and sanctifying faith that perseveres means that for us, faith must be an all-consuming priority. Look at what Habakkuk says. Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Verse 4, Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous will live by his faith. What's going on here? In the flow of the book, Habakkuk complains about the injustice that is not punished in Israel. And God assures him that the immorality and injustice that he sees practiced in Israel will be vindicated. Israel will be punished and he's going to use a pagan nation the Chaldeans to bring about that punishment. When Habakkuk hears from God about the way that this injustice in Israel is going to be punished by this pagan, even worse nation than Israel, then he is left reeling from that news. And he wants to know from God, how is that the case? What about the immorality in that nation? How in the world are you going to use them to punish a nation? Yes, evil, but more righteous than they. And in chapter two, verse one, he waits for the Lord to answer. And when he waits, God does not disappoint. Verse two, then Yahweh answered me and said, write this down. Record the vision and inscribe it on tablets that the one who reads it may run for the vision is yet for the appointed time. It's still future, but it hastens toward the goal and it will not fail though. It tarries wait for it for it will certainly come. It will not delay. I'm going to tell you Habakkuk a prophecy. This is coming. Write it down. Make sure everybody hears these words. So they know before it happens, I said it, this is what's coming. And what he details in the verses that follow is the punishment, not of Israel, but of the nation that he's going to use to punish Israel, the Chaldeans. And so when we begin in verse four with this behold, it's a listen up, watch this, pay attention As for the proud one, that's a specific reference, most likely to the Chaldeans, the nation he's going to talk about. His soul is not right within him. It's an acknowledgement of God. He recognizes that this is a wicked nation. This is an arrogant people. But the righteous, not them, those who are opposite them, they will live by faith. Furthermore, he goes on, wine betrays the haughty man so that he does not stay at home. He enlarges his appetite like Sheol, and he is like death, never satisfied. He also gathers to himself all nations and collects to himself all peoples. This is what they did. They conquered nation after nation in the most ruthless of ways as they did not stay at home, i.e., They went forward, didn't remain a nation within its own boundaries, but they went about conquering uh, 
you'll remember Smed's series in Daniel and evening services that we completed recently. This is what the Chaldeans were known for. This is what they did. And eventually they conquered Israel. The last nation, Judah. So this statement in verse four is an acknowledgement that they are a proud people. They are proud. Their soul, his soul is not right within him. This is all in contrast to what he calls the righteous one, and which is the quote that Paul picks up in Romans one, the righteous will live by his faith, but the righteous will live by his faith. This is opposite. What's just been described in the beginning of verse four, the righteous is not the proud one. The righteous has a different kind of soul in him that is right within him. And unlike the proud one who does not live by faith, he's a self-assured, independent, self-reliant, self-righteous individual. The righteous one lives by faith. Let me just point out a couple ways that just comparison between what we read here in Habakkuk and what we read in Paul. Okay. You're getting a quote in the apostle Paul of this passage. There's some interesting nuances, interesting differences to note. Literally Habakkuk says, just look again at the end of verse four, but the righteous will live by his faithfulness. And if you're reading the new American standard with footnotes, you probably have a footnote there. Faithfulness. That's literally the translation by his faithfulness, not his faith. So what's, what's the apostle doing when clear as day in the new Testament in Greek, the word is faith. The righteous will live by his faith, not his faithfulness. Habakkuk says the righteous will live by his faithfulness. Paul has taken that and said the righteous will live by his faith. The in-between translation between the, the words that Habakkuk wrote, between the, the words that Paul wrote, you get a translation of the Hebrew scriptures in Greek called the Septuagint. Okay. Habakkuk wrote Hebrew, Paul wrote Greek conveniently. And in God's providence, we have a Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures. Here's what the, the Septuagint says. The righteous will live by my faith. And maybe that's not as helpful. Maybe that's just more confusing. The writers, the translation, the translators of the Septuagint who spoke both Hebrew and Greek took God's words to Habakkuk to mean my righteousness, i.e. God's righteousness. Here's, here's how you can reconcile these, how I think is a, a helpful way to reconcile these. Paul seems to be quoting the Septuagint, but dropping the first person pronoun, my, the righteous will live by faith. No pronoun, not his faith, not my faith. He drops it, but he does pick up the, the Septuagint's word faith instead of faithfulness. You following? Why does Paul do that? Why is Paul, instead of just, uh, clearly he's aware enough of the, of the Hebrew to drop the pronoun, my, and he's just taking Habakkuk as meaning it's the, the believer's faith, not God's faith somehow, not the my, God's faith, but the believer's faith. The, righteousness, the righteous will live by his faith, Paul says. And so Paul, I think what's happening here is he is actually communicating the same thing Habakkuk's communicating in a way that's helpfully communicated in the Septuagint to make the same point Habakkuk's making. The righteous person lives by his faith. But it still doesn't answer the question, why does Habakkuk use the word faithfulness? This 
what, what we see in this is the perfect precision of every single word used in God's, in God's scripture. It is perfect. It is exquisite. There are two other words that God could have communicated to Habakkuk that communicates the, the New Testament idea of trust or exercising belief. Two other Hebrew words that are not used here in Habakkuk that could have been fairly used to communicate an exercise of belief. Those two words uh, are two Hebrew words, uh, batach and yara, trust and fear. And those words would have been very good selections to say the righteous person lives by his own faithful life. Could have made the same point with different words, but why doesn't he? Here's why. These two words, righteousness and faith, appear in another context that makes the point that Habakkuk and Paul want to make. Can you think of any other passage before Habakkuk that uses these two words, righteousness and faith? Righteousness and faithfulness. Genesis 15, 6, the passage of all passages uses this same term. And here is what is declared in that all important verse in your Old Testament. It is the statement of Abraham's justification. Genesis 15, 6, Abraham believed Yahweh and Yahweh reckoned it to him as righteousness. The two roots found in Habakkuk and then picked up by Paul, righteousness and faith are found here, but this passage highlights Abraham's justification. He believed God. That's the same word found in Habakkuk translated faithful or faithfulness. It's the same root word that he believed God. He exercised faith in God. And what did God do with that? Well, he declared him righteous. God, the judge said of Abraham, that sinner is righteous. Because he believes me. So here you have in Habakkuk a neat tidying up, if you will, of a crucial biblical principle that the righteous lives by his faith or said another way by his faithfulness. The point is to believe God is the same thing as to live in keeping with that belief. Faith and faithfulness are not very different. When Abraham believed God, that manifested itself in a faithful life. When Paul says the righteous lives by faith, then that means the person who believes God will prove God's righteousness from faith at justification all the way on through persevering faith in sanctification. It's the same thing. If you believe God, then it will demonstrate itself in a faithful life. Not a perfect life, but a faithful life. And the word here that keeps getting repeated, believe, faith, faithfulness, is from the root word that we derive our English word from amen. Amen. This is a validation and affirmation rather of what God says is true. Does your life say that? Is your life that? Is the way you live an affirmation? I believe God. God is true. Let all men be liars. The choices you make, the company you keep, your spending habits, the priority that you give to body life in the church, 
do all of those things, every area of your life, say to God and to a watching world, amen, God is true. And the person who says with their life, amen to God, God amens that person's life. God says, affirms their life. It works both ways. Is your life amen by God? Does God watch the way you live and go, amen? Look at my righteousness on display in the exercise of that person's faith. Christian, this just calls to the forefront. Do we make faith the all-consuming priority in our life? Pursuing faithfulness is not something separate than believing God. You've never pursued faithfulness outside of believing specific truth that God's communicated. So go after believing God in an intentional way. In every decision you make, do you have God's truth at the forefront of your mind? We can pursue this on our own. We need to help each other pursue this. Wives, help your husband. What does God say is true? Let me remind you. Husbands, lead your families. Let me remind us of what God says is true. This is why when I'm leading, we're going this way. That will help you live from faith to faith, as Paul calls for in the gospel. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for truths that are astonishing, marvelous, that just leave us breathless, that we can believe you because you are pleased to save us through faith. Make us competent men and women and children to entrust ourselves to you, not only with our eternity, but on a moment by moment basis. And God be glorified by such an exercise of faith. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.